Against the background of the International Women's Day celebrated recently, Law Weekly speaks to a senior advocate of Nigeria, a successful arbitrator, and a well-celebrated professional, Mrs. Dorothy Ufot. She shares with us how she's been able to break barriers and challenge the status quo. And as part of agenda setting for the new chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, another senior advocate, Ebolu Adeborua, has made a call for reforms in the commission. He would like to see the EFCC free from political influence so that it can work independently and fearlessly. We also have our recap of the top trending stories from the courtrooms. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Sheeli. It takes a lot of guts and courage to pursue what one really wants. And one person who knows this too well is my guest, Mrs. Dorothy Ufot, SAN. Against every contrary advice, she went back to school to study law after a first degree in political science. That decision to study law backed by a strong determination has propelled her to heights many are still desirous of achieving. She obtained a BSc in political science in 1983 and an LLB from the University of Lagos in 1988. In 1996, she got her LLM also from the University of Lagos. She was called to the Nigerian Bar in 1989 and 20 years later in 2009, she was admitted to the INA Bar as a senior advocate of Nigeria. Mrs. Ufot also sits on the boards of a lot of reputable companies locally and internationally. She's listed in the international who's who of commercial arbitration lawyers, recognized as leaders in the field of international commercial arbitration. She shares with Law Weekly how she's achieved all of this and more. My first shot would be that uh, women, we, we've moved, we've made some progress. Things are not as bad as they used to be. Uh, we've shattered many glass ceilings. We just finished uh, a, a, a webinar where the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations addressed us uh, by the you know, Dangote group. And one takeaway that I had from that is that the glass is half full. We need to fill the other part of the glass. And um, asking me about my story as a woman, I'm not going to deceive you that it has been um, a tea party. It hasn't been a tea party, but it has called for a lot of determination and hard work. And looking around and asking yourself, where do I want to be? In my own case, I did not set out to be as quote and unquote, successful as people think I am today. I just had a mindset of excellence. I set out to be a lawyer and I determined to be a successful lawyer. Because I saw that you read political science first. Yes, but I reminded myself that originally your main plan was to be a lawyer. So I had to go back to school all over again to read law. And when I was in my first year in Unilag, I saw people who were younger than me, and I was almost intimidated, asking myself, are you sure you're doing the right thing? What am I doing here? Uh, what am I doing here? From the day I entered the class in Unilag, I realized that if I've taken the decision, by the way, I was discouraged, starting from my parents, because I'd met my husband, who was then my boyfriend, before I finished political science. And typically, the whole idea was finish, you found a young man who has also finished his own school, so why don't you settle down to start a family? So I went back to read law against every advice. I finished Unilag in 1988, I was called to the Nigerian bar in 89, and immediately there was only one ambition, to work with a son. I was fortunate, I was um, taken on by Mr. Harry Afalabi Ladner, one of the best lawyers that this country has produced. He took me on and I spent five years there, seeing the respect that he was given in court by 
lawyers and judges, I determined that I will get to that high point. So I started my career on a note of determination. Along the line, I got married in the University of Lagos. So everything as I have done or achieved as a lawyer has been as a married woman. A few days ago, you were celebrated by your state government, not only as the first female SAN in Akwa Ibom State, but also as a professional of many firsts. And that brings me to my next question. All the hats that you juggle, wife, mother, career woman, leader, mentor, how do you balance it all? Is there any secret? I will not pretend that it has been easy. It also calls for determination. Now, uh, on the International Women's Day, we had a webinar from the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. And one of the questions that was put to me was, can you have it all? Career, marriage, and children. And many women had different views. I think I was an exception. And I said, yes, it's tough, but you can have it all. Now, how do you have it all? You just have to prioritize. You have to be determined. You have to focus. I call it when I am mentoring young women, I call it excruciating focus. It's not an ordinary focus, excruciating focus. That's my normal language in talking about this. Because you, you see, the things that militate against women, in my experience, and I, got, I had that at the back of my mind from the day I decided to be a career woman. What militates against women? For instance, as a lawyer, People will be reluctant, particularly in litigation. People will be reluctant to instruct you for a big case as a married woman. Why? Because they feel you're going to come with excuses. Uh, my child was sick. My husband didn't let me stay out late. You which, know, which is a normal part of everyday life it, of a married we, person. Yes. If you want to aspire, you must not allow anybody say, oh, you know, women, they come with all sorts of stories. So what am I saying? Once you have made up your mind to combine the role of career, wife, and mother, you just have to be prepared. You cannot let the client's case suffer because your child is sick, or because you have to cook. And in all of this, even as a son, I still go to the market, I still cook, and I still have time you for- You play all those traditional roles. I play all those. I love cooking, personally. And what has also helped is a very supportive husband. And um, such, People should be congratulated. And I implore most men. You see, I think it's unfair to stop a woman's career because she's a wife. If the husbands lend a helping hand and the women earn the trust of their husbands, I think women can combine. It's very doable. I have done it. I have two children, two children, sorry, and both of them are very successful. Let's round off talking about alternative dispute resolution because I know arbitration is one of your many core passions. You're an internationally renowned expert and you've also, you're also an experienced litigator, so you see both sides. Why do you think it is difficult for ADR to be fully embraced in Nigeria by litigants and even lawyers to settle local disputes? The greatest challenge of alternative dispute resolution in Nigeria is the parties agreeing to comply with the results. And so the challenge is that in Africa, in Nigeria, people now see ADR largely 
as a first step to litigation, which is very unfortunate. You see, in the advanced countries, an award is delivered, you lose. Once the process has been conducted, you know, with bearing in mind fairness, the rule of law, and uh, all the um, all the things that would make challenging an award, because the parties and their counsel are there. They see the way the process is going. And automatically, because they have signed to resolve their dispute by this private mechanism, they understand what it, you know, what it entails. So the moment, the moment an award is published, the loser complies, issues its, his check. They accept it easily. And they accept it easily. But in Africa, in Nigeria, one of the biggest challenges is the enforcement of that arbitration award. And so you find that people are now beginning to think, should we really go into arbitration? Personally, I've been trying to enforce two awards for over two or three years now. What makes it difficult to enforce? Because you have to go, if there is no compliance, you have to uh, enforce through the court system. And once you venture into the court system, you will take the entire um, uh, run from high court to court of appeal to Supreme Court, which is unfortunate. You've not so really saved any time. You've, not, you've not really saved any time. And people are now propagating, do we need a special ADR court that doesn't follow the usual you know, appeal system? What some jurisdictions have done in that they have, in their laws, they've incorporated an appellate system within the ADR mechanism that if you lose and you are dissatisfied, another panel within that institution, mainly institutional arbitration this time, another panel is set up made of different experts to review what has been done. And that is the exit six system, which I have found to be very good in that you avoid the courts completely. So, and the decision of that panel is final. So it's quicker. So I feel very strongly that if we have this put in place, this appellate system, a, a, not appellate system as within the court, within the arbitration process, where a different panel reviews what has been done and the decision of that panel is final. I think it will go a long way to assist us in ensuring that arbitration is not a first leg of litigation, which is what we find now. Another problem that um, litigants have, you see, as an example, you're going into a contract with Shell. Shell has standard arbitration clauses. None of those multinational companies will go into any contract, no matter how small, without an arbitration clause. They've been doing it. They understand it. What I find with our local companies, when you talk about local content, the fact that Shell, Mobile, Ajip is willing to do business with them is, is, is fantastic. They don't go the extra mile to ask someone, please vet this contract for me. I agree that in many occasions, there's nothing you can do about it, depending on who the stronger party in the contract is. But at least I tell people, even if you cannot do anything about it, understand what you are going into and understand that 
if a dispute arises, this is the way we're going to go. You can hardly find an agreement today that does not have one form of dispute resolution. People are shying away from the courts. Our judges know the rules now. So when these cases go to them, if you've signed an agreement that has an arbitration clause and you go to court, if your opponent raises it without taking any steps in the, in the, in the case, Definitely today I can assure you that the Nigerian court will send you to arbitration because that is what you have agreed to do. So we are at that level where our court system is arbitration friendly. Mm -hmm.